We're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 14. So we've been talking about the chronology, chronology of uh, the book of Revelation. <clears throat> there are some things that are in chronological order, and it's important for us to understand how that all plays out. But not everything in the book of Revelation is chronological. Some of the chapters and some of the sections are uh, insets. So they may not be chronological, but they're talking about something that's going on while something else is unfolding. It's also going on at the same time. So we're trying to get a better handle on that. And, um, and so we left off in the book of uh, Revelation in chapter 14. And uh, that's where we're going to pick up. And chapter 14 begins with talking about the 144,000. And, and what's pictured there in verses 1 through 5, it's talking about Christ having returned, and the 144,000 are there with him. So chronologically, as you look at the book, Christ hasn't returned. That's not until, uh, that, that doesn't play out here for a little bit. But that's, it's picturing that, and you have to realize, okay, where does this fit in with everything else? It talks about the 144,000 that have been faithful to God. And then we get into, beginning in verse 6, we talk about the uh, uh, three angel messages. Uh, verse 6 talks about an angel that is preaching the everlasting gospel. And it says that, the, that this angel is going to preach the everlasting gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So, <clears throat> what is the everlasting gospel? Well, it uh, is the same gospel that Enoch preached in his time. It talks about in the book of Jude that Enoch will return with 10,000 of his saints. The coming of Christ and Enoch will return with, with the saints. Uh, the everlasting gospel has been preached since the time of Genesis 3.15. Man sinned, and in Genesis 3.15, God reassured mankind, yes, you have sinned and incurred the death penalty. But you know what? It's all going to work out. And it points forward to Acts chapter 3, verse 21, which is the restitution of all things. It's going, all going to work out. You've botched it. You're expelled from the garden, but it's all going to work out. My plan is still on course, and you can be assured of that, that the Savior is going to come, and, he is, uh, and the gospel has not changed. It is the everlasting gospel, also known as the gospel of Christ, the gospel of peace, the gospel of grace. And it's always pointed to judgment and the rulership of Jesus Christ and his saints and the ushering in of a time of real peace and happiness. And the first of these three angels is going to go out to the world preaching the everlasting gospel. Everybody's going to be able to hear this message, and, um, and it's being avail made available to all. Because, and you have to realize that people speak different languages, but they're going to understand what this angel is saying. And it's going to be available to all dwelling on the earth at that time. Revelation chapter 14, 7 Saying, it says, saying with loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has, co has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. So the same message was preached and made available in Enoch's time. It's the same message that Moses gave. It's the same message that God's prophets have brought, that Jesus Christ and the apostles gave to worship the creator, not the creation to recognize who is the giver of life and who lays out right and wrong and we are to live by it. So during the time of the seven trumpet plagues that we read about in chapters 8 and 9, there's this message going forth and doesn't say how often, doesn't say when exactly, uh, when people hear it. And in all, in all probability, it's going to be preached at, uh, in the time when the two witnesses are preaching as well. Then we have the second angel spoken of in Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. And that angel is telling the world that the, Babel, the system of Babylon is going to fall. The system that is found in this world at this time is going to fall because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So during the time of this preaching by the second angel, Babylon exists. It hasn't been destroyed yet. 
But the angel is saying that it's about to fall, in, in essence telling the world the handwriting's on the wall and the judgment is final. And uh, this city that represents a great worldwide economic and religious system is doomed. It is doomed and it is to be destroyed. As it talks about in uh, Daniel, it talks about the, the stone made without hands hitting the statue and that statue basically is blown away like chaff in the wind and never to be resurrected again. And God is going to destroy this system because of its doctrines, because of its teachings, and because of the evils that it is, pro it is, it is propagated as a system. The third angel is mentioned in Revelation chapter 14, verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tor tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And what's, what's the message that this angel preaches? It says, don't accept the mark of the beast. Don't have anything to do with that system. And uh, if, you, if you choose to accept it, there will be consequences, very serious consequences. Basically, it says, don't follow the beast or the image. Don't be part of that system, because if you do, then you will drink the wine of the wrath of God. So this angel is a little more specific as to timing. It says Jesus Christ will return, and in his presence, those who follow the beast and have the mark of the beast are going to be tormented with fire and brimstone. And uh, it speaks of the holy angels. It'll be done in their presence. So are they the ones that are going to pour out the fire and brimstone? Possibly. And so this verse is a warning about what is to happen at the last great battle at Jerusalem. The message will also go out to all peoples on the earth. Everybody will hear it and be able to understand it. And, you know, as you look at what's transpiring here, some truly amazing things are taking place. Angels are going to shout out certain things. People are going to hear trumpets all around the world. When it talks about the seven trumpet plagues and the things that unfold there, people are going to hear those trumpets. And they will hear the seventh trump, which will indicate the coming of Jesus Christ. They're not symbolic. People will hear the sound of those trumpets all around the earth. And... Uh, you know, I know for me, uh, maybe I'm, a, you know, a slow, slow to get things. I, I just didn't really think about that they're actually going to be heard. But why have the sounding of a trumpet if nobody's going to hear it? So people will hear it uh, because God wants them to hear it and realize what's unfolding. Revelation chapter 14, verse 11 says, uh, speaking, you know, you have the fire and brimstone uh, and the people will be tormented with that. It says, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they make no rest, uh, have no rest day or night to worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And when, when is this all going to take place? Revelation chapter 14, verse 8 tells us it's going to be in the time when Babylon falls. And verses 9 and 10, uh, we can see this takes place uh, at Christ's second coming. And those who have part in the system of uh, Babylon and who are punished in this way uh, have no rest day or night as long as they remain in the land where uh, God's wrath is being poured out. Wisdom would say, get out of the way, don't suffer this. And God warns them that this is coming. You need to, as you know, to get out of town just as Lot was told to get out of Sodom uh, before all of the fire and brimstone were rained down on that city. God will warn people to get out. Verse 11 says, The smoke of their tormented sins forever and ever. Does this mean that they're going to be tormented forever? It doesn't mean that. It means that they're going to suffer until death. The wages of sin is death. It's not eternal torment. They will suffer, and, and the smoke of their torment will rise uh, into the atmosphere, and uh, 
They're not going to be tormented forever. Chapter 14, verse 12. Chapter 14, verse 12. It says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So it's talking about the saints and talking about how they persevere, how they're enduring. And, they do, and how do they do so? They do so by following the commandments of God. And they do so by the faith of Jesus Christ. So they have faith in God and they act on it by keeping the commandments. And, uh, and they're, they're dedicated to that. They're not going to compromise with that. Verse 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. And um, so uh, why you might ask, why are people dying in the Lord during this time? They're dying in the Lord because the beast is enforcing his mark. If you do not take the the bark of the beast, then there is going to be persecution, and some are going to be put to death because they have been faithful. Uh, th those who are, were not protected earlier did not have the name of God written on their forehead. And some will return to what they were taught. They've been taught, they've heard the truth, maybe not lived it, but as this begins to unfold, it's going to register with them, hey, you know what, we've heard this before. And uh, they are going to turn back to God and, and remain faithful. And those who die during this time, they're giving, given rest. Their race is finished. They can't be persecuted anymore. And um, they, will ha they have the opportunity to uh, be a part of God's family and uh, will be a part of the first resurrection. Then it gets into a couple of other things that are interesting, beginning in verse 14. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, that is, Jesus Christ, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, and uh, this is the fourth angel that appears in this particular chapter, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle. And reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So what's it talking about here? This is an inset in the chapter itself. And so we have the battle, which is uh, often called Armageddon by people, but Armageddon isn't really the name of the battle. It is the battle of... Uh, uh, the great day of God Almighty. And um, as you begin the chapter, you see the 144,000 and Christ having already returned. And now we have in this particular section, uh, Christ returning in the air. We find that uh, he has a golden crown and a sickle. And the, the, he's told to harvest, the, the, there's a harvest to be made uh, because the earth is ripe. And what is to be harvested? What is Christ going to harvest? Well, he's going to harvest the saints. The saints who have been faithful. The saints who lie in the grave awaiting the return of Christ. And they will rise to meet him in the air. We know that uh, Christ, that we are told about that more specifically. With, uh, and get certain details in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. So, that, uh, that the first being that's talked about here is Christ. And he is the one who is there and a, very much a part of uh, the harvest of the first fruits. Then we come to a, another angel, which is a separate event, the event beginning in verse 17. It says, Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also, the angel, has a sharp sickle. And the, uh, this angel is not coming out to harvest good fruit. He's coming out to destroy the bad fruit, uh, the tares. And chapter 14, verse 18, it says, And another angel came out from the altar, who had, the, had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of, of the wrath of God. 
and it's not describing fruits that are to be harvested in the resurrection of the first fruits. This is something else. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So there's this massive group of people who have gathered at Jerusalem. They had gathered there to, for, to battle. You have a 200 million man army that's made its way from the east. They are there gathered at Jerusalem. They're ready to fight Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ says, no, we're going to continue on with the plan and you're not going to thwart it. And Christ will destroy those armies and all of the opposition of those peoples that are gathered there. But this, now this may take place uh, where the, all of this blood flows so deep may be in the Kindred Valley, which is between the Dome of the Rock and Mount, the Mount of Olives, where it's a confined space, and there would be a space where the blood might accumulate. But it is a dramatic and, and gory uh, situation that is going to take place. And, uh, and you hate that you have to come to that, but God is going to have done everything possible through the two witnesses, through the angels, to try to get man to repent. He's going to have poured, sounded the trumpets. He's going to have poured out the plagues. And the goal is that man would repent, but man is pretty hard-headed and will not repent. We move on to chapter 15 and the seven vials that uh, are poured out. The, and the seven vials are the final punishment. And this is where the chronology of the book of Revelation picks back up. It, it, uh, the chronology ended in chapter 12, and it picks up here in chapter 15, verse 1. Chapter uh, 15, verse 1 says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So there are two important words in this verse. One is last, the seven last plagues and the wrath of God. Uh, those are the two things that are important. And as you think about what's described here, there are a number of references in the Old Testament to the wrath of God as either lasting one day or a year. One day or a year. And this is why we understand that the day of the Lord is one year in length. The tribulation in all likelihood, is the two-and-a-half-year period. Uh, the first two-and-a-half years of that three-and-a-half-year period before Christ returns. So the first two-and-a-half years are the time when uh, the tribulation will take place. The last year is the time when God intervenes and pours his wrath out on the earth. Uh, this, the last year is the time of God's wrath uh, on all the evils of the earth. Uh, at that time, there will be no, no church, uh, and, and it, it talks about that you, the temple and all of that is not accessible, and, uh, and people cannot come to God uh, during that time because there is no church. There is no organization to help people along in that way. There will be people alive. Uh, they'll be persecuted and eventually wiped out, but there will be those people who are in the place of safety as well. So Isaiah chapter 34, 8, I'll just read it to you. It says, for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance. Now that's a day. But you know what? It's interesting what it says in the second part of that verse. It calls that day the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. So the day and year are the same thing the day when God's wrath will be poured out, God's vengeance. Isaiah 61 verse 2 says to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. It's when God intervenes and it will be a year in length, it's, it appears. So we can see that uh, when it talks about the day of the Lord at the beginning of the book of Revelation, it's not talking about the Lord's day Sunday it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the day of the Lord when God intervenes in world affairs and pours out his wrath on the earth and says, enough is enough. I've given you 6,000 years. I've allowed Satan to rule, but that's all coming to end and a new era is beginning. 
a, an era that is going to bring about blessings and prosperity for mankind, every, all men living on the earth. Now, chapter 15, getting back to that, uh, uh, talks about the seven last plagues. And um, verses 2 and 3 uh, is a picture, a little bit in the future, picturing the resurrected saints and speaks of them having harps. This is where we get the idea of uh, these people floating around heaven and they all have harps and they're all singing and this is what we're going to be doing all the time. But why do they have the harps and why are they singing? The reason they have the harps and why they're singing is because God has intervened. And just like when God brought Israel out of Egypt, they had crossed the Red Sea and they stood on the banks and they were free. They were free. God's people will be free. And they'll be singing, in all probability, the song of Moses, the song that was sung to uh, rejoice in the deliverance that had been given to them. And then, the, then God begins to explain to us what's going to take place with um, the vials that are going to be poured out here. And um, they, he describes them. And, uh, you know, we have some pretty terrible things that take place here as God's final uh, judgment is made. You know, we have uh, terrible sores that the world are going to uh, impact the world. We have the sea turned to blood. We have, uh, so, you know, as it's turned to blood, there's not going to be uh, a sustainable environment for all of the sea creatures. Uh, you look at uh, uh, the third uh, bowl is poured out and the waters, that is the fresh waters, are turned to blood. So you're not going to have water, uh, which is extremely important to hu human beings. It's not going to be available. Then we have uh, the fourth bowl, men are scorched. So somehow or other, uh, it's going to be, uh, the environment is going to be such that if you, you're, you're not going to want to spend much time in the sun because you're going to get baked pretty fast. Uh, so uh, what is the atmosphere going to be affected in some way uh, where the sun is going to have a, a deeper, Im a much more powerful impact on human beings? It doesn't tell us, but we know that uh, it's going to be very unpleasant. Then we have darkness and pain. So this is going to be a darkness that uh, encompasses uh, the world and people are going to be in pain because of the uh, the. the things that have been inflicted on them. And it says in verse 11, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Now, how are people going to know, like it says in verse 9, it says, and men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. Now, how are people going to know that it's God causing all these plagues? Are they just going to be something that comes out of nowhere? The reason people are going to know that these plagues are coming from God, it's just like the people of Egypt knew that the plagues that were poured out on them were from God because Moses went to Pharaoh and said, if you don't relent and free my people, this plague will come on you. They knew that God was the one who brought about the plagues and people on the earth will know that God is the cause of these plagues because of the preaching of the two witnesses. So they will be preaching to the world during this time. And as a preface to each of the plagues, they will go and they will tell people what's coming. And uh, people will refuse to repent and refuse to heed uh, much to their own uh, suffering. Uh, then we see in the sixth vial, the Euphrates is dried up. And across from the east comes this 200 million man army. This massive army uh, makes its way across uh, the uh, east, they cross the Euphrates, they come up to this, to the uh, uh, Armageddon, the Megiddo, and the uh, uh, staging area there, and then they come, to, come up to Jerusalem. And there are demonic beings that are very much involved in this, as it says in verse 14. For they are spirits of demons performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So these angels go out and they get people to come up. They get the armies to come up to fight against Christ. They're going to fight against Christ. And this is where you see all of the, the blood flowing 
uh, there near the city of Jerusalem. So these, these, uh, the final plague is found uh, here in uh, the seventh bowl. The earth is utterly shaken. There's going to be this great earthquake, and it's going to be an uh, earthquake like none that we've ever known, and it's going to be an upheaval like we've never known. And, um, and it's going to, I would say, rearrange a lot of things as a result of that great earthquake. A lot of things are going to fall, but it's going to change the way a lot of things are in Jerusalem and in the Middle East and I would say around the world. And it will be uh, different on the other side of that. Then we come to chapter 17 and 18, and I'll more or less summarize what we're told here. Uh, there, the, chapter 17 and 18 are essentially inset chapters. Uh, they're not necessarily chronological. If you remember back to chapter 13, uh, the first 10 verses talk about uh, the beast that rot comes out of the sea, the political entity that comes out of the sea. You can't see it, and then all of a sudden it's out of the sea and it's on the scene. Uh, the destruction of the beast rising from the sea is foretold in chapter 18. Now, chapter 17 describes the religious power. It is also ch described in uh, chapter 13. It's, it describes that religious power being destroyed. And why is the religious power, which rises after the beast from the sea, uh, and uh, the political power, the ten nations, why is it pictured as being destroyed first? The simple reason is it is destroyed first. The ten nations, the beast and the ten nations that he rule, rules over, turn on the religious power. They turn on the religious power and uh, they don't like the way that the religious system has been riding them and uh, they, they destroy it. So God allows them to fight each other and then attack the religious system and the civil uh, system turns on the religious beast and uh, destroys that system. It is first to die. Secondly, uh, Babylon the Great will fall for the second time. And here we see in chapter 17 the great harlot, the great false religious system is finally destroyed. And it is um, destroyed and, um, and, uh, and that system comes to an end and thankfully so because it is a, a system that has led people astray and that false religious system has been in existence since the time of Adam and Eve, you shall not surely die. And it's been a basic, that idea has been a basic premise of most of your great religions. And that that whole system will be done away with. And, um, you know, the, it says in chapter 17, verse 15, uh, then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, the false church, and make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So the, the political beast will destroy the religious beast. In chapter 18, we have the completion of God's judgment on Babylon, that great political system that is is now thrown off the shackles of the false religion. And that, that uh, great system, that political system, it says in chapter 18, verse 24, in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and, all, and of all who were slain on the earth. Uh, God then puts the blood of his people on Babylon and destroys Babylon. And the returning Christ destroys the armies that are gathered at Jerusalem and the entire system. And then we go on to chapter 19, and chapter 19 speaks of the return of Jesus Christ. It speaks of, um, it is uh, somewhat parenthetical, uh, because it is the scene of the preparation in heaven for the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, so uh, chapter 19, verse 1 says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. Verse 2, for true and righteous are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot. He did that by causing the beast to turn against her, who corrupted the earth with her fornication, he, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. 
in chapter 19, verse 3. They said, Alleluia, her smoke rises forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. Verse 6 announces that Jesus Christ is now returning to reign. Verse 7 speaks of the marriage of the Lamb, and um, the wife has made herself ready, and that marriage is to take place between the Lamb and, and, uh, and the, uh, the wife. And uh, verse 8 speaks of the resurrected saints, who are symbolically arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, representing the righteous acts of the saints. And bless, the blessedness is spoken of in verse 9, of being able to be a part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, uh, you know, that's something we've all been invited to. So as Christians, God has said, you are invited. You are invited to participate in that. And uh, we look forward to it. And there have been things, you know, we, the, the speculation is, when is the marriage supper of the Lamb going to take place? And I don't know the answer to that. I do know there will be a marriage supper, and I do know that we as God's people will have the opportunity to be there. But, um, you know, in talking about different things, there, you know, one thing that I know to be true is if m when my son got married, I look forward to his being there. I could not imagine my son getting married and me not being there. Now, if that's the case, then I would expect the father to be there at the marriage supper of his son. Now, I don't know exactly when that's going to be, but I would imagine the father's going to be there. That's just me. And if I'm wrong, guess what? I just want to be there. And uh, that's, that's my speculation and something that I've thought about. I asked somebody about this, and, and uh, all he did was say, well, what do you think? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. And he didn't know either. So it's something we're still sorting out. But it is, but there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb of which we can be a part of, and uh, we most definitely want to be there. Chapter 19, verse 11 uh, begins the chronology again. Chapter 19, verse 11 um, speaks, and now when I saw, now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And this is speaking of the return of Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and uh, goes on to describe his return. So the end of chapter 19 talks about this great, great feast for the birds because of all of the death that has taken place. And why do these birds come? And why do they, are they there for this great feast? Because there's so much death and destruction and all these bodies laying there uh, is just a, a, a way, you know, disease could very easily break out. So God ensures that that's not going to happen as his kingdom begins. So that takes us through chapter 19. In uh, chapter 20, we spend a lot of time on that at the feast and we're very familiar for that. We have... Uh, and then in verses 21 and 22, we've gone through that in, a, uh, in sermons uh, that I gave after the feast. So let's end in, with a few verses from chapter 22, uh, beginning in verse 3. Revelation chapter 22, verse 3. It says, And there shall be no more curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. It's talking about a world that is beyond the world that we know, where there will be no curse. We live in a world where the curse is still here, it is still pre present, and we live under that every day. And that curse is not going away until Christ returns and lifts it. Now, we are not under the curse of the law, which is to die because of sin through Jesus Christ. But in this time, the curse will be removed. There will be no more sin. There will be no more curse on the earth. It will be the most glorious of times as God the Father uh, dwells on earth in Jesus Christ. Verse 6, it says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the 
of the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. In one sense, this is the conclusion of the book. And what it's saying is everything that is written in this book, we know as revelation, is going to come to pass. And the, the reason, in one sense, of looking at this coming to pass quickly is once it all begins, once it all begins to unfold, it's going to happen quickly. It will pass quickly, and Christ will be here. Once, the, in a sense, the, the starting gun goes off and we're three and a half years out, it's going to be a tumultuous time, but it will go quickly. And the wonderful thing is, is that there is everything that is good and positive for all humanity as it, it uh, plays out and unfolds. Chapter 22, verse 7, it says, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. And that's the challenge. Will we keep the words of the prophecy of this, this book? The words such as, we are to endure to the end. The words, keep the commandments of God. The words, follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Will we do that? Will we keep the commandments of God to the end? Verse 12, and, I, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. That's a promise to you and me. Why continue in the faith? Why continue down this path? Why stand up for the truth? Why live the truth? You know, we talked about certain things we're to do as men and women. Why do that? Because you want to be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. You want to be a part of what's going to unfold and to receive the reward. You'll receive eternal life, but the reward, what will you be doing in the kingdom of God? God said, I'm going to have the pleasure of giving you your job, your responsibility in the kingdom. And you're going to be a part of my family forever. And then he ends by saying, blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. We are offered, through Christ, the tree of life. But you know what? We're going to be able to eat of that tree forever. And in the millennium and in the great white throne judgment period, we're going to help other people to see that that tree is available to them through Christ as well. And that tree will be in, this, in the kingdom, as it's described in Revelation 21 and 22. And everybody there will eat of that tree. And what a most wonderful time it will be.